we see this cascading effect of reducing SIBO, correcting dysbiosis, ameliorating leaky gut, and the spillover benefit to not only less toxins and inflammation in the brain, but also a reduction of the limbic system and the correspondent improvements in memory and in mood. Let's discuss the four main benefits of probiotics and how supplementing with probiotics can improve SIBO and dysbiosis, leaky gut, then have the spillover benefit to the brain, reducing brain inflammation, improving cognition, and also improving mood and even the stress response. And finally, equip you with a protocol you can use at home. Okay, so one of the most important benefits of probiotics is their ability to release these antimicrobial peptides. But there's an interesting backstory that we should have really quick to help us appreciate the long-standing impact of probiotics on health. Now, if we go back to the early 20th century, a Russian researcher, Eli Mechnikov, observed that people living in a certain town in Bulgaria a village town in the mountains, lived longer and were healthier than those around them. He postulated it was due to the consumption of fermented milk. And the fermentation unintentionally was leading to health benefits in part because the fermentation will extend shelf life, but it does it by releasing antimicrobial peptides that it's almost similar to pasteurization in the sense that it'll prevent bacteria from building up and leading to overgrowth of unsavory things that can spoil, in this case, the milk. But Mechnikov didn't know exactly what was doing that. A different scientist, Stemin Grigorov, a, a tough uh, last name, identified lactobacillus in the milk, and then Mechnikov termed this bacteria lactobacillus bulgaricus, one of the first probiotics discovered. And you'll see in many modern day formulas, this lactobacillus bulgaricus due to this Bulgarian village it, it um, was discovered in. And when we understand how powerfully the antimicrobial substances by fermentation are in extending shelf life, it sets the stage for understanding benefit number one of probiotics, which is their powerful antimicrobial impact. They release these bacteria, bacteriosins, these compounds that are, again, are antimicrobial, and they're released by a few different bacterium, lactobacillus, bacillus, Pediococcus and Streptococcus. These bacteriocins are very interesting in the sense that not all bacteria all the time will release them. There has to be an accrual of a certain amount of bacteria. This is sensed through something known as quorum signaling. And once a colony hits a certain size, almost like an army, then they will release these compounds or akin to the army attacking. And this might be why we see a certain dose threshold or consumption threshold of probiotics or fermented foods is needed to achieve an antimicrobial and or clinical benefit. That's some of the backstory. Interesting. But like I always say, show me the data, show me the evidence. So there's three points I want to share with you that really demonstrate how powerful probiotics are in combating fungus, bacteria, and parasites. The first, Going back to 2013, a meta-analysis found a 51% clearance rate of SIBO with the antibiotic rifaximin. 2017 meta-analysis found a 53% clearance rate of SIBO with probiotics. So similar efficacy of an antibiotic as a probiotic in the treatment of SIBO, point one, point two, 2013 randomized control trial that found nystatin was as effective as probiotics in the treatment of candida. And then point three, a 20, uh, 2006, excuse me, randomized control trial found that when treating Giardia, using probiotics plus antibiotics was more effective than using antibiotics alone. So this gives us good outcome data showing that when we intervene clinically, probiotics are powerful in terms of being antimicrobial. And 
when we understand this, we can then appreciate benefit number two, which is improvements in leaky gut. And when we discuss leaky gut, we're really discussing what's happening in the small intestine. The large intestine is five feet. Small intestine is 22 feet. And if you take that 22 feet and map out the absorptive area, it's 2,700 feet akin to a tennis court. It's also one cell thick, so you can absorb nutrients. And this is where 90 plus percent of calories and nutrients are absorbed, but it's also more prone to dysfunction, right? So the leakage can occur due to the very sensitive and selectively permeable aspect of this membrane. And this is also why the largest density of immune cells in your entire body resides in the small intestine because there's stuff coming through and you want the immune system there in case anything gets through that shouldn't. And this is part of the reason why leaky gut can be so pernicious. And I want to share with you a image that we adapted from Frontiers in Immunology. And what you're seeing here is probiotics have the ability to modulate microbial homeostasis. Said another way, dysbiosis can become eubiosis, imbalanced, balanced. SIBO can go to non-SIBO. And when you have this favorable impact on the microbiota, that leads to a couple things. One, a reduction of leaky gut. And that's what you're seeing here, a reduction of endotoxin, aka LPS. And when this occurs, there's less inflammation, as you're also seeing here with less TNF-alpha and interleukin-6. And all of this collectively helps us see how important probiotics are for modulating the microbiota, dysbiosis, and SIBO by so doing, reducing leaky gut and reducing the activation of your immune system. And I just want to underscore the fact that this image that I'm sharing with you here is from a 2023 meta-analysis, really exciting, just published, that documented everything we just went through in a rigorous scientific fashion that probiotics in fact do, when studied scientifically, demonstrate the ability to reduce leaky gut. So that's benefit number two. And when we see the improvements in leaky gut, it's probably not surprising that we also see reduction of gut symptoms like IBS, improvements in inflammation and autoimmunity as in IBD, and a reduction in constipation, all of which have been demonstrated in separate meta-analyses of clinical trials. As we clean up things in the gut, it's probably no surprise, or hopefully not a surprise, that we'll see things improve in the brain because there is this gut-brain connection. And part of what happens when there's an issue in the gut is you can have a buildup of toxins and or increased levels of inflammation. And either of these or both of these together can eventually lead to particles getting into the brain that shouldn't, triggering the microglia in the brain, sort of the cleanup cells in the brain, leading to inflammation in the brain. And this is where we see some of the neurocognitive side effects or symptoms associated with leaky gut. And there is a model here in conventional medicine that demonstrates this. It's known as hepatic liver encephalopathy, um, the disease of the brain, essentially. Very interestingly, two separate clinical trials amongst a growing number have found that either probiotics or separately the antibiotic rifaximin can improve this hepatic encephalopathy. And what happens here is the liver cannot adequately clean toxins as one of its functions. They build up in the blood, they cross the blood-brain barrier, and then they trigger an immune response, inflammation in the brain, and this leads to encephalopathy, aka brain fog, aka MCI, mild, uh, mild cognitive impairment. And again, the exciting thing is that either supplementation with probiotics or administration of antibiotics have been shown to reduce this and also improve the cognitive symptoms associated with this condition. But not only that, a 2021 meta-analysis has found improvements in cognition in those with Alzheimer's, with aging in general, with diabetes, with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, and also in those with depression. Now, also important to mention that in those who are healthy, 
they don't go to super cognition if they use a probiotic. Um, so if there is something deterring cognitive function that's gut or liver related, these people seem to benefit, or at least according to some preliminary data. Now, the other aspect here that ties in with brain health and with cognition also ties into mood and to stress. So not only is there the connection between the gut and the brain through toxins and inflammation, but also through modulation of this really important center or system of your brain known as the limbic system. And the limbic system covers a few functions, but most chiefly memory and tagging events as fearful or stressful. And what I want to share with you here is, oh, and by the way, if this has been helpful, please like, comment, share, or subscribe. Would love to engage with you and hear your thoughts on the gut-brain connection. As someone who suffered with issues here myself, I was very happy to improve my gut health and therefore reduce my brain fog. Uh, but the image here of the limbic system, you can think of the limbic system as a loose heuristic, as having two tracks. So taking a step back, the limbic system is comprised of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. And track one is more so the neuroendocrine track, how stimuli that are neurological, right? You see something like a car accident happen, and this stimulates an endocrine response of, let's say, catecholamines and adrenaline. So this is the thalamus, hypothalamus, and remember, the hypothalamus governs the pituitary, which sends all these signaling molecules like those to produce stress hormones. So this is track one, more so neuroendocrine. Track two, and this is what we'll detail here in a second, is the hippocampus and the amygdala. And the hippocampus more so governs learning and long-term memory, and the amygdala more so governs learning through fear, meaning if you did something that was scary or unpleasant, this is mainly where the amygdala tags events. Okay, so bear this in mind as we come to this 2017 randomized control trial where they found a reduction in the activation of the amygdala when they administered probiotic supplementation, which also correlated with improvements in depression and reductions in IBS. And this is not the only study of its kind. A different study found a reduction in the activation of the hippocampus and just to, uh, uh, from probiotic supplementation. And just to quote the researchers here, commonly, the hippocampus appears hyperactive in patients with depressive symptoms. The hippocampal deactivation over time in the probiotic group is assumed to reflect the beneficial effects of probiotics on depression-related cognitive impairments. And what you're seeing here is a reduction of activation of the hippocampus in the probiotic group that was not demonstrated in the placebo group. And again, they're tying not only cognition to this change, but also mood. And this is sort of the intersection of mood and memory, the limbic system. So if we can modulate the limbic system, this is how we can see both improvements in cognition and improvements in memory. Now, the final point here I wanted to come to was how do you find a good probiotic? And unfortunately, there seems to be a lot of confusion regarding what probiotic to use the healthcare consumer is the target of marketing claims. So every company out there is going to try to spin and tell you why their formula is the best or the most scientifically studied or uh, has the best species or strains. And if you trace that, what you usually see upstream to that is the companies that own the different strains are different pharma houses. And I don't mention this because if there's any malintent, but it's just a natural byproduct of financial incentives. If you produce a probiotic, you want to fund a study demonstrating benefit from that probiotic. And then you want to put out materials that showcase why that probiotic is good. But what ends up happening is the consumer is hit with a dizzying array of these and has a hard time understanding what probiotics to use and what probiotics not to use. So if you take a meta view, you see that really most probiotics are one of three types. They could be a fungus, Saccharomyces boulardii. 
They could be a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, or they could be a soil-based probiotic, usually containing bacillus strains. Now, some formulas mix across types, but 80-ish percent plus of probiotics and probiotic research can categorize into this type. Now, remember, throughout our discussion, I've mentioned meta-analysis, 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 meta a number of meta-analyses. Bear in mind that each one of these meta-analyses is summarizing different clinical trials, in some case, five clinical trials, in some case, 10, what have you. And those different clinical trials are using different formulas. So what this tells you is that different formulas can all show benefit. Therefore, you don't need a, a magical or a special probiotic formula, but you should look for three main things. One, a company that follows GMP or good manufacturing practices. And this tells you they are going to adhere to quality standards. Two, third-party independent testing to assure viability. And then three, that the probiotic is devoid of common fillers, irritants, and allergens. And then the final point here is the protocol. And this is where we see the three different types come into play. Your lactobacillus and bifidobacterium blend have been found to be most effective at a dose between one and 10 billion per day. Anywhere in that range is fine, between one and 10 billion for a period of two to three months. Or you can use the fungus, Saccharomyces boulardii, at a dose of between 10 and 15 billion per day for two to three months. Or you can use a soil-based probiotic at a dose of between two and six billion per day for two to three months. You do not need to use all three together, although often in our consulting practice, we will, and we've been finding this is akin to a super probiotic, it's a little bit more effective, but to start, pick any one of these that follow GMP third-party testing and are devoid of allergens, and give it a trial for two to three months, and then reappraise your symptoms, and hopefully you'll be experiencing less, if you have any, digestive symptoms, but also noticing that your cognition is better. And as we outlined, we see this cascading effect of reducing SIBO, correcting dysbiosis, ameliorating leaky gut, and the spillover benefit to not only less toxins and inflammation in the brain, but also a reduction of the limbic system and the correspondent improvements in memory and in mood. So if you are suffering with gut brain symptoms, one thing you should definitely try, check with your doctor first, is a probiotic protocol. And here are three options you can use to help improve your gut health and your brain health.